All right, I think we're broadcasting live here. And I'm glad that Kensley said that she watched my video last year. Um, did you watch the Jazz game last night? I did not, but they won. I heard that. Yeah, we won. We, 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 we avenged the other one. Uh, what is this? I don't need that. Go away. All right. So the question is, what does 95% confidence actually mean? So I want to give you a real life example. I stayed up way too late on election night in 2016 making this very spreadsheet. I have not updated it since. <laughs> okay. But let me just explain what's going on. If you'll remember, on election day 2016, Hillary Clinton was going to win, right? She didn't win. She was going to get 270 on election morning. I believe this came from NBC News. They had predicted that Clinton was going to get 268. Trump was going to get 204, but they had 66 votes that were they called battleground. Okay? So it really looked like Hillary Clinton was going to win. Now, have I mentioned the website 538.com before in here? Yes. What is, why, why is it called 538.com? Yeah, there's 538 electoral college votes. And in 2012, between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, he nailed every single state. 50 for 50. Or 50 well, actually, they count the District of Columbia, so that's 51. 51 for 51. He nailed them all. Perfect score. However, in 2016, he didn't do so good, okay? He missed four states, okay? Now, the thing that I find impressive about this, um, so CNN said, you know what, Florida is too close to call, we're not gonna call it. But 538 said, well, it's leading Clinton, we're gonna call it for Clinton, okay? But they were wrong, but they, but they went out on a limb. They weren't gonna be wishy-washy like CNN and NBC and say, ah, it's a battle plan. Yeah, it's too close to go. So um, there were four states that they missed. Florida, Michigan, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. Now the problem, or the benefit, I guess, depending on your point of view, with the Electoral College, not every state is created equal. So for example, Utah is a small state. We get six electoral votes. But California is a big state. They get 55. So it's not as if every state matters equally. California matters a whole lot more than Utah, okay? And so you'll see here in the case of these four states that they missed, Florida has 29 electoral college votes, Michigan 16, North Carolina 15, Pennsylvania 20, okay? So the problem is when you take something like, oh, we're gonna give Florida 29 votes to Hillary Clinton and that flips to Donald Trump, that's a 60 point swing. So now, so if you miss on Florida, well, you drop Hillary by 29 votes, we'll say 30 to make these. So she's at 239, and he bumps up to, uh, he had 29 to there, 233. So now it's neck and neck, right? That's just one state to make a different thing, okay? So here's the four states that he missed on. So Florida, Michigan, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. Now my question to you, let's assume they're using 95% confidence intervals. And let's pretend every state is a simple random sample. Okay? So we've got 50 states plus the District of Columbia, that's 51. Okay? So of those 51 states, what percent of them would you expect to get to, for them to get correct if, if we're assuming 95%? 95%, right? Now, when we look at this, well, they got, okay, so they missed on four. So they got 47 out of 51 states correct. That's 92.1%. That's about what you would expect on the 95% confidence interval, right? They missed four. That's, that's what you would expect with 95. If you're going to get it right 95% of the time, or you're going to get it wrong 95% of the time, okay? So that's what 95% confidence means. And in real life, you know, 92, it was, it was about right on. You can't get much closer than that, okay? So that's like a real world example. Yeah, they missed on four states. Now let's look at those states that they missed on. Typically your margin of error is three to 5%, okay? So let's look at Florida again, okay? 
Now, when 538 said that Hillary Clinton was going to win, they were predicting Hillary was going to get 48.1% of the vote, and Donald Trump was going to get 47.5% of the vote. So there's only a 0.6% difference, right? So it's close. But 538 is like, we're not going to be wishy-washy. We're going to call that for Hillary, okay? Now, clearly, 0.6 is within your margin of error, right? Okay? Well, let's see how it actually worked out. This is as of 8.53 p.m. on election night. Okay, that's why I have that time up. Okay, they predicted 48.1%. She got 47.7%. Would you call that a hit or a miss? Pretty dang close. They were within 0.4%. If you're talking a 5% margin of error, they nailed it. Okay? They nailed it. She was correct. However, let's look at Donald Trump. They were predicting 47.5% in Florida. He got 49.1%. He got 1.5% more. Okay? 1.5% more is still in your margin of error, correct? Okay? So did they whiff on Donald Trump? No, he's within the margin of error. The problem is, okay, whereas Hillary was winning here, Donald won. So they missed the winner. So everybody says, oh, that, that was a bad poll, right? I mean, they're within one and a half percent, okay? You can look at some of these other ones, okay? Um, I think it was in Michigan, Donald was 44, he got 47, that's off 3%, okay? If you're talking a 5% margin of error, that's still a hit, like they, they were right, okay? And, um, but if you want to, if you want to say, well, it was only three percent margin of error, you could maybe say, well, they 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 undercounted Donald in Michigan. Same with North Carolina, forty-seven versus fifty. That's exactly three percent. And Pennsylvania, forty-five versus forty-eight. So they were about three percent low on three of those four states. Okay, on on Donald Trump's support, and it swung the whole election. And in fact, these numbers almost split because of those four states. Now the reality is, did if, if, if every vote counted equally, who won the popular vote? Hillary Clinton won. They got that correct, okay? So when you look at this performance-wise, this was as good as you can get on a 95% confidence interval, okay? They got 92% of them correct. That's about what you would expect, okay? Does that make sense? Do you understand what 95% confidence means now? Brady? What? What? Do you understand? That's 90, the percentage that you just said. Do you understand 95% confidence? Do you understand what that means now? Yeah, the United You're going to be right 95% of the yeah. time, and you'll be wrong about 5% of the time. Okay? Good. Um, last time we talked about how. how the larger your confidence interval is, the larger your margin of error is going to be. They're like an industry standard. Just yeah, typically it's 95%. Okay. Now, having said that, I do want to... Oh, you know what? I wasn't even sharing this whole thing, was I? I just did that whole lecture, and nobody got to see my nice little graph here. Let's share it really quick. Oh, you guys are supposed to... Well, I guess you wouldn't know that. All right, so here's my nice graph that I just lectured about that nobody saw when I was pointing at stuff. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, so typically the industry standard is about 95%. Now having said that, um, I used to work on a genetic study. They were trying to figure out what genes were associated with, um, with psoriasis which is a skin disease, gives you that. Anyway, it's awful. But um, in real life, you can choose your alpha to be whatever you want it to be. Typically, it's going to be 0.05 or 95% confidence, okay? Now, if you're doing a genetic study, your alpha is not 0.05, because that would be way too high. It is 1 times 10 to the minus 16th. Now, do you understand what that means? Nope. Nope. One, two, three, four, five, six, okay, seven, yeah. eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. It seems crazy. 
But the problem is you've got so many genes in your body that if you use 5%, you'd probably end up with like 2,000 genes that might be associated with psoriasis. So they use an alpha equal to that. And even with that, they get about five, five to six. Okay. And then they're like, well, one of these five or six might be associated with psoriasis or cancer or whatever. So if you're doing a genetic study, this is actually much more common. But in real life, for polls, almost everything is going to be 95%. Okay, so and I've, and I've often said, sometimes on my quizzes and tests, I forget to tell you which confidence interval to do. Assume 95% if I, if I forget to ask, okay? Yes? In scientific studies, like, the study is significant if the p-value is 0.05%. So it's less than 0.05. Less than 0 .05. Yeah, right. yeah, which is the same thing as 95% confidence, okay? Now, since you mentioned p-value, and since I was trying to decide if I wanted to follow the book, uh, I'm going to diverge from the book, but we'll go back to it next lecture. So what I'd like to do today really is probably the most important lecture that I'm going to give you for the rest of the semester. So it's a good thing you're here, and I actually went and got my, my camera so that we could record this. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you an outline, basically, not only for the rest of the semester, okay, but this is a great outline for your final project as well. Okay, so um, so you're going to want to use this. I'm going to give you an outline. This is not in the book, and tonight's homework is not going to be in the book. I'm going to create a special homework set for you guys. I'm going to it'll, it'll be just like a word document or something. That will be your homework for tonight. Um, because what I think it's good to give you an overview of everything, and then hopefully. You'll use this overview for the rest of the semester. Okay, so um, was there a question? No? All right. So um, here's what we're going to call this. Um, I don't even know if we want to call this a chapter. It's kind of related to chapter 17. Um, you can use chapter 17, but I'm going to go over chapter 17 on Tuesday, okay? So you, so just, I want to make sure that we've got this, okay? So the question is how to pick the correct statistical test slash confidence interval, okay? Now, the reality is chapter 17 deals with a hypothesis test and hypothesis tests have the same assumptions as confidence intervals okay and so I'm going to kind of be teaching you confidence intervals and hypothesis tests because they're relate they're they're basically two different ways to do the same thing um, Colin just mentioned p-values that's what we're going to be talking about when we talk about a statistical test but the, the the alpha applies to both just as well okay so, step number one, list all the important numbers in the problem, okay? So we kind of did that last time in class, but um, so some things to look for, find means, or proportions. Um, B, find the standard deviation. These are things to be looking for. And you need to distinguish between the population and the sample. That's going to be a critical skill. Okay? If you can't distinguish this, you're going to get it wrong. Okay? C, note the N and the alpha, okay? All right, so that's so when you see a problem, the first thing you should do is just list all the important numbers, okay? Number two, step number two, is the data quantitative or categorical? Okay? Now, we did that back like the first week of class. 
And I think you all thought that was relatively easy. It's going to come back with a vengeance. Okay? You've got to make sure you've got that skill down. Okay? Step number three. Maybe I'll give myself a little bit of room here. Find the null and the alternative hypothesis. Okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about that. The null hypothesis, what does that mean? Okay? It's typically written as H sub zero. Okay? And it is a math statement that uh, I guess I already just added it. <laughs> mean, um, it always, and I know you guys like that word, has an equal sign in it. Okay. Oh, except for I better not put always. Almost. There will be one exception to that rule. Okay. Almost always has an equal sign in it. Two, it's a statement of no change, no effect, or no difference. Okay. So is that I like one and then the other one's just this is one and two, yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, or here I'll also throw in here a fair coin. There's another example. What is what is two say? It's a statement of no change, no effect, no difference, or a fair coin. Okay? Can you uh, translate all this? We're gonna do an example in a minute. No, I mean like you can't hear? No, I can't. I said it like three times. <laughs> it's a statement of no change, no effect, no difference, or a fair coin. And above that null hypothesis, H almost L. always okay. has an equal sign. HL is a math statement. Math statement. So we see HL is a statement. I always talk while I'm writing. But you're writing really fast. But oh. nobody listens. They only want to see what I wrote on the board. That's what we're trying to write as well. Okay, so but can... here, listen. Okay? All right. Now, step number four is pick the appropriate, appropriate test or confidence interval. Okay? Now, let me just say that step number four but one, two, and three are hard enough. But step number four is probably the hardest step. Okay? Now, what let me break it down. What'd you say? Okay? All right. If your data are quantitative, okay? So now, now you can see why step number two is useful because you're going to use step number two in step number four. Okay. If your data are quantitative, it could be a one sample mean. Okay. Where you know the population standard deviation. Or it could be a one sample mean and you don't no population standard deviation. I almost went here last time, but I decided to stop because there was only one. No. Okay? Now, if, if you know the standard deviation, it's going to be a z-test. Okay? If you don't know the population standard deviation, it's going to be a t-test. And we haven't learned the t-test yet. I just want you to get used to thinking about this, okay? All of chapter 16's homework was this test right here. We did it with confidence intervals, but we could also do it with a hypothesis test, okay? So there's actually two answers here. Now, if your data are categorical, okay? 
then it could be a one sample portion or it could be an independence test independence we haven't learned that one yet either but we will okay that'll be the last one we learn if it's a one sample proportion it's going to be and maybe i should specify this is going to be for the mean both of these are for the mean this is going to be a z test for the proportion Okay, so it's also a z-test, but it's a different z-test. That's for both of them, the z-test for the proportion for independence? Or is it independent? No, you're jumping ahead again. But the if, if we're doing an independence test, it's going to be a chi-square test of independence. Okay. That's an x-squared test. It's, it's the Greek letter chi. It looks like an x. Okay. Now, some of you are going to call it chai, but it's a chi. It's Greek. It's not Chinese, okay? Chai tester. Chi. Yeah, you've heard of chai tester. Yeah, we use it up there. That's based on the Greek letter chai, okay? All right. Um, we may learn some more if we have time. Possibly um, we might learn a two-sample proportion. That one will also be a z-test. Z-test for two proportions. We also may learn, uh, if it's quantitative, we may learn a two-sample mean, which is also a t-test. Okay? So here's the reality. Okay? You're going to learn at least four, probably six, okay, tests. And so that's why step number four is the hardest because you've got six choices here. Now, if you think six is a lot, we do 13 in my math 2040 class. Who's ready to sign up? Okay. Why would you want to Yeah, because it's fun. All right, so this is why step number four is the most difficult, okay? All right. Um, I don't really want to erase anything. Oh, I don't know. Two samples. Okay. He You've got this all written down, I guess. I don't want to erase anything, and I don't want to look up that. Wait, can, just can give us just two seconds. Can I ask a question? Okay. Ask so a question. you have like the um, on number three, the last word on the statement. It's like no, no effect, no difference. Well, all the way back. No effect, no difference. No effect, no difference, or a fair point. Or fair point. Yeah. Fair point. Okay. Okay. Yes. The last one says two sample proportion is a Z test. Two proportions. Two proportions. Two proportions. Two proportions. Two proportions. So we're going to learn. So here, here, here's the other thing. We're going to learn a multiple Z equations and multiple T equations. Okay. And the thing that I do want to point out, while step number three deals only with the statistical test, all of these other steps apply to confidence intervals as well. Okay, and in fact, you may find that even when, even if you figure out the null hypothesis for your confidence interval, that may help you to interpret the confidence interval correctly. Okay, because that's one of the one of the one of the most frustrating things about this class for me, and and I will say also math twenty four is people do all the steps right and then they get the last step wrong. We're not even done with the last step yet. Okay, and I'm trying to decide. I really wish I had more board. And that's too far away from the camera to see. The problem is if I turn this off, oh, we got that's a great idea. Okay? You should just type your notes on the computer. <laughs> and do that? And yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Oh, you know, and that's the video. Yeah. Yeah. Blow it up really big. Okay. So here, here's what we'll do. I'll leave I'll leave what's on the board. 
Here we go. We, okay, I'll share. I'll do that. That's not a bad idea. Fine. Then you guys can't complain about my. You can complain about my typing then, though. That's the only thing. Okay. So here, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a brief summary here. Okay. I gotta share this screen. Share. All right. So step number one. List all numbers really quickly. Step number two is um, quantitative or categorical. Step number three is no alternative hypothesis. Step number four is pick the correct test. Okay, step number five. This is the new step is find the p-value, okay? How do you find the p-value? You're either going to find it either from the chart or the computer, okay? We'll talk about how to do that. Step number six is decide to reject or do not reject. This is also a difficult step for people. Okay, so because it's a difficult step, let me give you a nice little phrase. I did not come up with this phrase. Apparently, the tutors in the math lab came up with it. It is not politically correct, but it is memorable. Okay, and here's the phrase that pays. Okay, if the p value is low, reject the <laughs> no. Reject the hoe or the no. Okay? You can remember that. And, we're, and when we're talking about p value, you're going to compare to alpha. Okay? So when we're talking about is your p value low, is it lower than your alpha? That's what we're talking about. Okay? And step number seven. is to write the conclusion in English, not statistician. Okay? And here's what I mean by that. Do not use the words reject or hypothesis in the conclusion. Okay? So let's do, I was hoping we could do, we'll probably only have time for one example, but we will probably do, so I'm going to try, let me think here, what are we doing with chapter, well I was going to give you a good easy one. We may spend a couple of days on this because... Yeah. This is, this is, okay, this is the test that's going to be brutally hard. I'm just going to warn you right now, okay? And I'm trying to decide if I want to break it up into confidence intervals. They didn't break it up into confidence intervals and then hypothesis tests like I wanted them to. They're going straight to hypothesis tests. So I felt like I should give you an overview so you know where we're going, okay? So in one sense, this class is going to get repetitive because we're going to go through these seven steps over and over and over, okay? You need to memorize these seven steps, okay? I've actually had people memorize the whole outline, and that's great because hopefully it helps them get the right answer. And that's the purpose of this outline, okay? Um, and I want to do an easy one, not one like the homework, though. So let's just pretend here you and I bet on a coin. What? Okay. Um, so, out of ten tosses, it comes up seven heads. Is there evidence that I am cheating you?
Okay? I'm doing this one because I think it's pretty easy conceptually for you guys to understand. Okay? So what do you think? Seven heads, three tails. Before we do any statistical tests or anything, do you guys think that there's enough evidence that I'm cheating because it was seven heads and three tails? Probably not, right? Okay? So here's what we're going to do. What if it was nine heads? Maybe, right? Ten heads? Pretty good, pretty good evidence, maybe. Okay, so the question is, how do you decide? Is seven heads the decider, is eight, or is nine, or is ten? So how do you decide, okay? We could do it with a confidence interval, and we can do a confidence interval here in a minute, okay? But, in fact, we could, if we have enough time, we'll try to do this with a confidence interval, and we'll do it with a hypothesis test. I want to introduce to you a hypothesis test, because that's what chapter... 17 is going to be talking about, okay? But don't worry about doing the homework. I'm going to give you some special homework tonight, okay? All right, so step number one is list all the numbers, okay? Now, the question is, I got 10 heads and 7, you know, sometimes you can do these out of order, too. Let me back up, because I th actually think step number two is a better question. Categorical. Okay, and hopefully if I get step number two, it'll help you with step number one, okay? Well, I'm doing 10 classes, it comes up seven heads. Are the data here quantitative or categorical? And let's vote, okay? Who says the data in this problem are quantitative? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Who says it's categorical? Landon's the only one. <clears throat> Why do you say it's categorical, Landon? Because it's heads or tails. Landon's the only Don't one that got that first. right. <laughs> it's categorical. Heads and tails are the categories. You all said it was quantitative because 7 and 10 are numbers, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's why we missed that problem. Okay, it's categorical, it's heads and tails. Does that make sense? Okay, let's go back to listing all of the numbers now. What's 10? The total total. 10 is the total, what letter am I gonna use for 10? M. M equals 10. What's seven? How about just plain old X? X equals seven. Okay. All right. That's all there is, right? We don't have much data here, do we? We don't have a standard deviation. Okay. We don't have. Uh, let's see. That's about it. Oh, the alpha. Okay. If I didn't tell you what your alpha is, what should you assume? 0.05. Okay. But, so that's the rule. If I don't tell you the alpha, assume it's 0.05. If I give it to you, use whatever I give to you. Okay? And this is a common problem for me. I always forget to give you the alpha. Okay? All right. So we've decided that this is heads and tails. It's therefore quantitative. Categorical. Excuse me. It's categorical data, right? Okay. So the null hypothesis. Okay? If we're using categorical data, the question is... Oh, I forgot to... You know what, I forgot something here. On the null and alternative hypothesis, I told you what the null was, I didn't tell you what the alternative was. So I'll do this. So H sub zero, it, it always has an equal sign. Um, it's a statement of no difference. I'm just gonna abbreviate it like that. Everything else is true, what I said before. Um, H sub A or H sub 1, I, I, I use them both, and I can, it depends on the book. Some people put H sub A, some people put H sub 1. This is what's known as the alternative hypothesis, which is a statement we are trying to prove. Okay? Now, there's basically three things you're going to try to do. It's either going to be a less than, it's going to be a greater than, or it's going to be a not 
equal to. Okay. All right. So let's say here. Okay. So I'm trying to do a mathematical statement that has to have an equals in it, and it is a statement of no change, no difference, no effect, or it's a fair coin. So if it's a fair coin, which is what we're talking about in this case, how could we write it's a fair coin with an equal statement? What would you expect the number of times it would come up heads? Five, okay. Five out of 10, right? But if I flipped it 100 times, you'd expect 50. So how could I write five out of 10 or 50 out of 100 without saying five out of 10? One half. Okay, so something's going to equal one half, okay? Or I'd even say if you wanted to put 0.5, I'd be fine with that, okay? Now, the question is, and this is where I get super duper picky, okay? In fact, maybe I need to add a statement here. Um, here, I'll put that there for now. Okay, now, by the way, some people are going to do that, do what I just did on the test, and they're going to get half credit because it's half right. Okay. Another point about the null hypothesis is it's always about the population parameter. Okay. Now let's go ahead and list what are the letters that we're going to use for a population parameter. In fact, I will list them right here. If we're talking about a mean, what letter do we use for the mean? X bar. No, X bar is a statistic. Yeah, mu. I'm going to use mu. Okay. If we're talking about a proportion, what letter do I use for a proportion? The carry on P. Nope, that's a statistic. Uh, How about P? Boom. Okay. If we're talking about standard deviation, what letter do I use for standard deviation? Sigma. Sigma. Okay. So you can add that there. Um, so now that we're doing this, am I talking about a mean? A Prop, uh, proportion or a standard deviation? Talking about a proportion. So what letter am I supposed to use here? I'm supposed to use P. Okay. Mu would be incorrect. Okay. Whatever letter I picked for the null hypothesis, I'm going to pick for the alternative hypothesis. Okay. Now, the question is asking, so the, the, okay, because so the alternative hypothesis is a statement we are trying to prove. What are you trying to prove? If I'm cheating, okay. How do I use a greater than, a less than, or a not equals to say you're cheating? P is greater than this or less than this. So I put it in the middle. P is greater than or less than? And we didn't really define which one was cheating, right? Is heads cheating or is tails cheating? Oh, Did we? Okay. Now, sometimes we'll specify, but we didn't say if heads was cheating or tails was cheating. Did we? Okay. So I'm going to say, I'm going to use this for not equal to. Okay. So P does not equal 0.5. Okay. All right. So that's how you decide. If I had made a, a reference that, oh, heads are cheating, then maybe I'd have said P is greater than 0.5. Or if I'd have said tails is cheating, then P is less than 0.5 or whatever, okay? I didn't really specify, and if you don't specify, just say not equal to, okay? Step number three is to pick the correct test, okay? So it's not quantitative, we agree, right? So therefore, is it a one sample z proportion, a chi-square test of independence, or a two sample proportion? 
one sample. To one sample. Okay, so the, the equation that we're going to use, okay, is a Z1 proportion test. Okay. Now, in this case, now I'm going to show you multiple Z equations. Okay. The equation that you've already learned should be Z equals P hat minus P divided by the square root of PQ divided by N. And I'm going to underline that so it looks like a fraction. You guys remember that equation from the central limit theorem? I remember writing that down. I don't remember ever using it. Okay, we're going to be using it. Okay, this is actually not in chapter 17, but I wanted to come up with an easy one, and I think this is relatively easy. Now, by the way, let me ask you, is my sample size large enough? No, because less than 30 is the wrong answer. It is less than 30, but that's not the right reason. How big does your sample size have to be for a proportion? MPQ has to be greater than or equal to 10. Because it's proportion, it's not now. N greater than 30 is great for a mean. It's not great for a proportion. Okay, we're going to have different sample size rules here. So the, once again, it's categorical. So we've got to, to, to define that. Okay? I'm trying to decide if we're going to run over here. Okay, so tell you what. Here's what I'm going to do. Because I don't, I don't, I don't want to rush through this. And frank, frankly, to be frank, this is the, today is the day that this class just got hard. Okay. I think we're actually doing really good time-wise here, so I'm going to slow down. But the point is, the fact of the matter is, here's what I want you to do: for the next, wait, oh, this was step three, and this was step four. So here's what I want you to do. Maybe I'll just have you do the first three steps. On tonight's homework, I'm going to give you a special worksheet. It's going to be a Word document. I'm going to have you do the first three steps. Okay? And I just want to make sure that you can identify everything properly. And we'll worry about step four later. That'll be next week. Okay? Because I don't want to rush through this, this problem. Okay? So what? We're going to have homework. What do you mean? What? We're going to have the homework will be based on your quiz. Or the quiz will be based on your homework. If I didn't give a quiz, you would, might not show up to class. <laughs> okay. So yes, the homework. So the homework will be based. Or the quiz will be based on the homework that I'm going to assign later today. Okay. So ch when you do your quiz, there will be a link there to the to the homework, and I basically want you to do the first three steps. Okay. How many problems are you all give us? I don't know. A bunch. Enough, enough for hopefully you feel comfortable. Okay. So these will be the first three steps that we're going to work on. Step number four is where it gets hard. Okay. So see you all on Tuesday.